Hello everyone. Today in Respiratory Physiology Part 1, we are going to discuss about ventilation and uh, significant of significance of lung volumes. So uh, this will be the topics that will be covered in this topic, how ventilation is achieved, uh, the lung volumes, and uh, significance of dead space ventilation and minute ventilation. Normal physiological ventilation, as you all know, is negative pressure ventilation. So in ventilation, the most important aspect is the creation of a pressure gradient. You have to have a difference in pressure, which leads to a flow of air. And in negative pressure ventilation, the first thing that happens is the volume change, which causes a pressure difference, which causes the gas to flow and into the lungs and out of the lungs. How is this volume change caused? This is mainly by the respiratory muscles, primarily by the diaphragm, which moves downwards and causes an increase in negative intrapleural pressure, which draws air into the lungs. And the intercostal muscles act to stabilize the ribcage during inspiration. And expression is passive in normal physiological ventilation, and it occurs by the relaxation of the diaphragm and uh, as a result the, by because of the elastic recoil of the lungs and also the recoil of the rib cage the lungs intrapleural pressure increases and the air is forced out of the lungs in the initial part of the expiration the elastic recoil of the lungs and the recoil of the rib cage acts in the same direction but towards the end of the expiration the ribcage exerts a force opposite to the elastic recoil of the lungs. And once these two forces balances out, the expiration stops. Coming to the lung volumes, uh, sorry, before that, we'll go to some unique features in neonatal uh, ventilation. Uh, the new newborn ventilation is not as effective as the adult ventilation. The few causes for that is one, the most important cause is the highly compliant chest wall. The newborn rib is mostly comp composed of cartilage, and as a result, it is very soft and it is not as sturdy as adult rib cage. As a result, during inspiration, because of the soft compliant chest wall, there is in drawing of the uh, rib cage, and as a result, it is not uh, able to produce as high as uh, intrapleural pressure as in uh, uh, adult ventilation. Another aspect is the horizontal ribs, which does not take much, does not take part much in ventilation. And the diaphragm is morphologically flattened and it is not as effective as in adults. In adults, the diaphragm acts as a piston, but in infant, it acts as a fellow. So it is less effective. And uh, there is fewer fatigue resistant slow twitch type 1 fibers. As a result, uh, the diaphragm gets fatigued earlier. So when there is respiratory distress, these babies can go to respiratory failure early. Intercostal muscle activity is inhibited during REM sleep. Uh, so these intercostal muscles are not able to stabilize the rib cage during REM sleep. And we know that preterm babies and term babies spend considerable amount of time in REM sleep. So these factors make uh, neonatal ventilation less effective when compared to the adult ventilation. Come into lung volumes. Uh, so this will be a revision for you. Uh, tidal volume is the amount of amount of air that goes in and out of the lungs during a normal respiration. Expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that can be forcefully expired out after the end of a normal expiration. And the residual volume is the volume remaining in the lungs after a forceful expiration. And when you combine the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume, you'll get the functional residual capacity, which is a very important uh, volume. And it is this volume, it is uh, from this volume that the pulmonary capillary vessels exchange the uh, gases. So this is the buffer zone from which the gaseous exchange takes place across the alveolar capillary membrane. Uh, you know that when there is uh, inspiration and expiration, there will be change in the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. But this change is negated by this zone of 
buffer zone of air that is function of the soil capacity. That's because uh, the gaseous exchange takes place between the function of the soil capacity and the fundamental capillary blood even during expiration and expiration. And this uh, function of the soil capacity provides a constant supply of oxygen into the to the uh, capillary blood vessel and also removes the carbon dioxide constantly, constantly even during expiration and expiration, constantly uh, from the fundamental capillary blood vessels. How is it possible for a continuous supply of oxygen and carbon dioxide during uh, the expiration, both during the inspiration and expiration? That is, this is brought about by the large amount, large volume of functional steel capacity. That is, it is almost five times the tidal volume. Tidal volume is around 5 to 7 ml per kg, but functional residual capacity is around 25 to 30 ml per kg. So it is five times the tidal volume. So only a fraction of oxygen, uh, a fraction of gas is changed by the tidal volume. So functional residual capacity is able to keep the partial pressure of uh, partial alveolar pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen almost constant toward inspiration and expiration. Another aspect we have to be aware of is the closing volume. This is the volume of air in the lungs when the alveoli starts to close. So usually, uh, this closing volume is less than the functional residual capacity. That at functional residual capacity, usually the all, all the alveoli are open. But in some conditions, uh, like RDS or pneumonia, this closing volume can be more than the functional residual capacity. So at the functional residual capacity, the alveoli um, more alveoli may be closed. Okay. And now, coming to the implications of functional residual capacity. So, as I said earlier, it constantly it's a constant source of oxygen for the pulmonary capillary blood vessels, and also it receives carbon dioxide continuously from the uh, pulmonary capillary blood vessels. So, when the functional residual capacity decreases, it causes hypoxemia. It occurs because when the functional residual capacity decreases, it causes collapse of the alveoli, and the collapse alveoli does not take place in, in uh, ventilation and gas system, and it, it results in hypoxemia. So, how do we know whether we uh, this hypoxemia is due to the less functional residual capacity or due to any other reason? So, that can be found out only by increasing the distending pressure of the lungs. That is mainly uh, by increasing the CPAP or the PEEP when a ventilated beam. So when you increase CPAP or PEEP, the FAO2 requirement is coming down then. That means that you were um, ventilating the baby at a, a below optimum functional residual capacity. So hypoxemia is a, a important, uh, um, uh, important effect when there is when you are ventilating at less optimum functional residual capacity. Another uh, implication is the lung compliance. So when you are um, ventilating in a uh, when when you are ventilating with less than optimum oxygen residual capacity, most of the alveoli will be closed, and it takes more distending pressure for the alveoli to open. So you need to give give more distending pressure for uh, adequate in, uh, increasing volume. And when you are giving more than optimum oxygen residual capacity, your all the alveoli is already open, and they are over distended. So they again they will not take place. They they will not participate in Gas is exchange. As a result, there will be carbon dioxide retention. So both are not good. It should not be underventilating or you should not be overventilating. When you are in the optimum functional residual capacity, then uh, you need minimum distending pressure to cause uh, increase in volume and uh, you can ventilate with uh, the length with less uh, pressures. Coming to the dead space ventilation. Now, all the Tidal volume that enters the lungs does not take part in gases exchange. So a part of the tidal volume occupies uh, the areas in the lungs which does not take part in gases exchange. So these are mainly the anatomic dead space when uh, this, this is a volume of air that occupies the conductive airway, that is from the nose to the terminal bronchial. Also, some of the alveoli may not be perfused well. So this also will not take place in gas system. This is called the alveolar dead space. So when uh, combining the anatomy dead space and alveolar dead space is the physiological dead space. So this uh, uh, air will not take part in gas exchange. 
Now the anatomy test space is usually two mm per kg in a normal human. Now the significance of um, that space ventilation comes when you ventilate a very extreme low birth weight baby. Uh, when you um, intubate this baby, you should cut the PT tube as short as possible for that to reduce the anatomic dead space. Because in these babies, we will be ventilated like 5 ml per kg, and 5 ml per kg, and out of the 2 ml per kg, we will be in that space, and then uh, only 3 ml per kg will be participating in gas exchange. So we'll have, we have to decrease the dead space as much as possible. Coming to minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is the amount of air that enters the lungs in a minute. So that is, uh, that is, we get that value by multiplying the tidal volume, volume with the respiratory rate. Uh, and uh, out of this, only a part of the volume will take part in gases exchange. That is the alveolar minute ventilation. Uh, we can get the alveolar minute ventilation by reducing the dead space from tidal volume. So when you, when you subtract dead space from tidal volume, multiply with the respiratory rate, you will get the alveolar minute ventilation. And this is the determinant of carbon dioxide removal. When, uh, when there is alveolar increase in alveolar minute ventilation, there will be carbon dioxide wash out. There is decrease in alveolar minute ventilation. There will be retention of the carbon dioxide. It is uh, inversely proportional. And what is the significance of alveolar minute ventilation? Uh, when you are ventilating a baby and there is carbon dioxide retention, there are two ways in which we can increase the minute ventilation. One is increasing the tidal volume and the other is by increasing the respiratory rate. Now, which one is the better option? So definitely increasing the tidal volume will be the better option because when you are increasing the tidal volume, your dead space is fixed. So the proportion of increase in alveolar minute ventilation will be more when you are increasing the tidal volume. When you are increasing the respiratory rate, definitely your minute ventilation will increase, but proportionally the dead space ventilation also will increase. So the increase in alveolar minute ventilation will not be as much as when you increase the tidal volume. But uh, the problem is that we cannot increase the tidal volume beyond a particular level. So we will have to increase the respiratory rate at times. Now the normal uh, minute ventilation in normal newborn is around 200 to 300 ml per kg. That's all for now. So let's uh, see you in another uh, part two of the physiology of ventilation. Thank you.